that <clears throat> And would anyone like to volunteer to read the flag suit? I did not get a chance to consent here. Or I will be happy to read it. Sure. Read the flag suit. I'll read it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Would everyone please stand? Stand up your heart. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United, United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You're welcome. So at this time, I would like to have a motion to approve the minutes of the January 17th, 2023 regular meeting. It is recommended the governing board approve the minutes of the January 17th, 2023 meeting. I so move. Thank you, Ms. Lindy. Thank you, Ms. McBride. So ordinarily board members will not respond to presentations and no action can be taken. However, the board may give direction to staff following a presentation. This is the appropriate point in the meeting for members of the audience to speak on matters of special concern, not on the present agenda. Should individuals wish to comment on items on the present agenda, they may do so during this portion of the meeting or at the time the item is considered by the board. To address the governing board, please submit to the clerk of the board a completed speaker card prior to the start of the opening session portion of the meeting. Mistake number one. So I need a vote. I'm going to ask to call for the vote for the meeting agenda. Ms. Sabal? Aye. Ms. Lundin? Aye. Mr. Favela? Aye. Ms. McBride? Aye. And I will I will agree with all and say aye. Thank you very much. And I will reread it for all of you. So Mr. Favela, were there cards that were submitted? Yes, sir. Okay, we have three cards here. Okay. And um we'll ask uh, Sandy Forrest to come up and speak. Um, I'd like to wait until you discuss the redistricting. Sorry, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I, I just noticed that. Uh, redistricting. Okay. Um, so we can move on. And we have Leticia Maldonado Stamos. He's coming up the street. Are the both the cards that you have for That's me? Two cards for you. Right. So do you want me to just go ahead and speak on both the topics? Sure. You have three minutes for each topic. Okay. So. Um, okay, well, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you again tonight. Um, first of all, I'd like to talk about Fallbrook Alayer. I know we have some uh, new board members and staff members and community people that are not familiar with Fallbrook Alayer. Um, and, and its total title is Fallbrook Alayer Reading Family Literacy Project, Cesar Chavez Day of Service and Learning. This year, after a three year hiatus, uh, we'll be having our first in person. And um, it's noteworthy that Fallbrook Alayer is the only community event in North County that, um, and probably all of San Diego County, that did not shut down completely during the pandemic. And it's important to note that because um, this event uh, and then the project itself is 100% volunteer. And we have uh, families, we have parents, we have teachers, community members, that have that kind of commitment to this event to serve families in a time when it was very difficult for families that we did whatever we could to, to serve them. So I have some flyers here. And um, you know, it's, um, it's a, a brochure, <clears throat> excuse me, a brochure that we did up a few years ago. And I try to update it every year. Um, I don't think it's been updated since 2019. But just know that the figures in there are mainly related to how many people we served, how many books we um, distributed to homes, and how many parents and volunteers that we had involved. So it's April the 15th. I would like to take this opportunity to formally invite you all to participate. And um, if you would like to be a guest reader, Mr. Favela has been a guest reader, Ms. Lundin, people in the audience have been guest readers. And I think um, Leah Curcio has been giving you all information about how to how to participate in that way. 
If you're not able to do that, we invite you to come and just enjoy the day. It starts about 9.30 and it ends about 1.30. And this year we have two parents, Lorena Albino and Tanya Aguirre, who are in charge of the uh, craft fair, which has been something that we added because parents wanted the day to be extended. They actually wanted more than one event, but we couldn't handle that. So we extended the day by providing about an hour and a half of um, activities and dancing and music and food and, uh, and crafts. And this year we have 12 organizations and agencies in Fallbrook that will be hosting a table. We've never had that many. I think the most we had was five. So um, I don't think Lorena is here, but Lorena and Tanya, um, they're moms from Mayelas, and I, I just wanna give them credit for really going out and, and making the contacts. So um, again, I know that some of you are new. Um, I'm available if you have any questions and uh, be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Um, on the next topic, of course, I think it's on the agenda, uh, the superintendent. I would just like to once again um, urge those of you that are in the position of uh, making decisions about how we're going to move forward to um, select a new superintendent to please take the time to think about how this person is going to be affecting this entire community and the fact that over half of the students involved in this district are from Spanish-speaking families, uh, low income, and the person that, that you hire should be someone that the whole community can relate to. We would hope that you would open up your process so that we do have a community advisory group, maybe just interviewing and helping to vet. I know the high school did that a few years ago and uh, it was a very successful process. Everybody felt like they were invested and, uh, and it was part of what this community needed. So I just urge you again to please take that into consideration and, um, and give credit to the community because we know this community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do want to go back to Sandy Horse. You, you want to speak on redistricting, but it's not an agenda item? It is. It is? Oh, business. Okay, got it. I just want to clarify. Okay, so we'll call you up. Territory transfer. Yeah, it's not really redistricting. Okay. And so that's it then. No. All right, now we'll have reports from the board. First of all, basically, I just did a lot of training oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> for the CSBA. Uh, CSBA just hosted, or actually, it was DWK, a lot of uh, letters back and forth, but they're um, one of our law firms um, just had a, an all morning update briefing on the Brown Act and all the changes that have occurred legislatively over this last year it was very, very well done. And uh, uh, some new new things on the horizon. It's, it's an interesting, the Brown Act is so interesting to try and keep your arms around and really stay on top of. So that was a very helpful uh, orientation. Um, sure, I didn't do much this, this month. Um, but I do want to just observe and um, recognize that we're on Black History Month. Want to always uh, recognize the contributions that uh, African Americans have made to our society and advancing our society. And um, I always like to remind folks um, or tell folks about the story of Pio Pico, um, who had the ranch that we now know as uh, Camp Pendleton. He was uh, Afro Mexican and he was uh, governor of California. He was the last Mexican governor of California held the highest political office you could hold in the state of California, was um, uh, very much a, a founding father, you could say, of the state of California, um, uh, Pio and his brother Andres. Uh, I'm always fascinated by that story and, and uh, really every chance I can talk about it, you know, <laughs> I'd like to share that story. Um, along with that, uh, I had a chance to look through our, our website um, and uh, notice a lot of good posts Want to give credit to Seth and, and his team for um, make, making an awesome, awesome website um, where you can see uh, a lot of the, you know, it, pretty much any time I have questions, I go to the website first, try to find out, see if I can get it answered there. And a lot of times I do. Um, and But there's quite a few stories that are highlighted there. And uh, just want to make sure, you know, let folks, remind folks that the website's there. 
social media is always doing great. I, I love following the pages of all the schools. Mm -hmm. um, so if anything, that's that's what I what I did before <laughs> at the meeting. <laughs> all right. Brad, um, as for me, I went and um, drove around the Citro development, or Citro, and I was amazed how big it was. I wasn't expecting it to be that large from looking at the map um, and how intricate everything, or the streets and everything is. Um, at first, when I first saw it, I thought, oh, these were homes, they look very different. They're very modern. It's not one section is well, to me, almost futuristic because I've never seen anything, any kind of uh, um, housing that looked like that, it, the way that things were uh, designed. Um, so I was intrigued by that. And then, um, but yeah, it's a beautiful, very large community. And that's about it. Okay. And I've spent a lot of time behind the scenes. Um, we're getting some things ready that we're going to be going on a tour of all the sites. I can't wait. I want to see kind of every site that there is. Um, and then we're going to be doing some things to interact with the community, which we'll hope that you'll all come out to participate in. And last weekend as a state delegate, I spent my weekend with about 600 other teachers to let you all know that there's going to be about 2,000 laws that are going to be coming out that we're going to be looking over. 2,000, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to try to pair them all down. And then um, the things that I can share with you, I will. Hopefully it will not be all 2,000. Um, some of them are really, really good things to help children. Others, not so much. And so I play a role in trying to navigate getting the good things passed and the other things we don't necessarily want passed because it's not advantageous for students or teachers. So, but it means busy, busy, busy. And we want to invite you to come and, and experience some of that with us too. Okay. And I also have a statement that I would like to read for all of you. Board. So after listening to comments from the public <clears throat> regarding the JPA paying for the cost of a settlement agreement between the district and former superintendent, Dr. Candace Singh, I asked Mrs. Martin to contact the JPA and ask about insurance coverage or the possibility to recoup some funds. Mrs. Martin did so and provided a letter from the JPA with their response. I will ask Mrs. Martin to share the JPA's response in her report from the interim superintendent. Before turning the floor over to Mrs. Martin, I'd like to make a final comment on this matter. I understand that this has been a challenging situation for the district and the community. Please know that your governance team has looked into this matter thoroughly and explored all reasonable options. And with that, I will turn it over to Mrs. Martin. Thank you, Dr. McRae. Um, as you mentioned, I did pose the questions asked to the JPA about insurance coverage. The JPA does not provide coverage or reimbursement for this type of situation because the payments to Dr. Singh are the result of a settlement agreement reached between the district and Dr. Singh in lieu of a lawsuit being filed. The JPA would possibly provide coverage if this was a judgment ordered as a result of a lawsuit. Uh, I did share this information directly with members of the public who addressed the board regarding this matter and provided complete contact information on their cards they filled out prior to speaking. But it was also important for the governance team uh, to share this with the general public. Now, something uh, on a happy note here, um, you know, we are so proud of the outstanding work that happens here every day at our schools. So tonight from my report, I'm happy to share a short video highlighting a few of the amazing events that are ha happened around our district. I plan for this to be a regular item at future board meetings with students providing the introduction. So it'll be much more entertaining and, and uh, <laughs> they'll probably say it much better than I can. But I do want to thank Mr. Seth Trench and his team, our, our communications director, for actually putting the video together. I don't want to take credit for something I didn't do. And then to thank all of our school site staff um, for everything you do day in and day out for our students. So tonight, I'm excited to share uh, some fun moments that were the 100th day of school celebrations, Live Oaks Leadership Rally, Lunch on the Long at, Lawn at Fallbrook STEM Academy, and College and Career Day at Potter Junior High.
That made me feel good because I teach middle school and the little ones are nicer. <laughs> you can tell they're much nicer and happier. So our Thunder Day came in the lounge, whatever. <laughs> Um, okay, so under board operations, number one, information on the superintendent's search. So I'm going to also pass that to Margie. Okay, we got it. Uh, good evening, everybody. It is my pleasure to um, uh, introduce Dr. Yolanda Rogers. She's joining us from the San Diego County Office of Education uh, Human Resources Division. She's the assistant superintendent there. And she's going to provide a presentation tonight on options for the board in selecting um, a superintendent and then what the county office, the services that they could provide, should that be the path that you choose. I'm going to give you paper copies too. So. Okay, very well. Extra oh, thank you very much. Well, good evening, Board President McRae and the fellow board members um, and interim superintendent Martin. Thank you for having me here this afternoon to, or this evening actually to represent um, and present to you the several options that you have as you move forward with your search toward the next leader for Fallbrook uh, Union Elementary School District. Just wanted to start by outlining a few options, but also going over the services that we offer at the county office. But one thing I want to really emphasize here is the superintendent search is the single most important decision that a school board makes when choosing the right individual to serve as superintendent. So this this um the search should be handled with transparency and objectivity. And so one of the things that we'll talk I'll talk about tonight are the options that you have. Um, I've outlined three options here, one being uh, recruitment that's done by the internal HR team. Another option that you have is to contract with a search firm. There are several, a variety of search firms out there. And the, the third option would be to um, use our service at the county office as an outside consultant as well. I'd like to start by talking through a bit about the internal HR team. Some key points you'll want to think about if that's one of the decisions you are considering would be the, um, the time and energy. Typically, our HR teams in a district are really tapped with resources and time and um, very busy. And this type of recruitment requires lots of intricacies and, and de detailed um, oriented process. Um, and the, the main important thing to think about is the importance of being able to maintain credibility of the process, as well as um, we just rec we recommend using an outside consultant that, that does two things. Number one, that individual, that company, that firm can dedicate the time, the resources, the effort, and the lens to be able to ensure that there is transparency to the process. It's something that a search firm does regularly, so they are very familiar with what to look for and how to seek out those individuals that we may not be thinking about as, as, a, as a governing board or community. So um, we want to be able to ensure that the board stands firm, is able to stand firm in the process, because there's always this type of a position is very emotional for a community, for a board, for staff. And so the importance of a transparent process that you all can stand firm to be able to say, no, we, we followed the process. It was fair. It was transparent. It was equitable. Um, the other thing is um, the process being above reproach. Those are the really big, important pieces. It protects not only the board, but also the person that you select coming in. If there's been a clearly outlined process, there is no need, no reason that there could be any um, any uh, reason for anyone to say that this process was nefarious in any type of way. So I want to just encourage you all to think about those few things when you are um, considering your options here. I um, have a couple of notes. I'm making sure I don't forget all of it. <laughs> the other thing is that um, when you're using a, a particular search firm or a, even the county office, we take the time to work with you lay out a really clear recruitment process and selection process that again not only protects the governing board but also the individual selected 
And um, we don't want there to be any um, any room for for any um, any any uh, I would say unfair uh, allegations toward for using the county office. Um, I'll go through our process now. We are committed to the work that we do. Um, we commit to a clear and transparent process. We ensure that you, as a governing board, that we are providing guidance through, through all, many of the phases, all the phases of the process. We ask typically that you select a point person. Sometimes that is the board president. I've also most recently completed a process where it was the outgoing superintendent who was retiring. So it just depends on how you all want to go about this. Um, and we're committed to bringing forward highly qualified candidates that are aligned to the um, uh, criteria set forth by the governing board with input from the various stakeholders. But in order for us to bring forth those high quality candidates, a, an outside consultant must be able to um, commit to a confidential process. Typically, we have um, sitting superintendents who apply, and they're not ready to put that out there to the community until they are a finalist. So also, we want to be sure that, um, that the size of the recruitment is large enough to allow you plenty of um, folks that you can select from and measure against the criteria that you're looking for. And it also just allows the consultants to help with vetting. What we typically will do, and I'll go through that process in a minute, is to vet for you, but also allow you to see the entire candidate pool. Um, we also continue engaging in ongoing communication. So through that point person, through email, through board presentations, but also through um, posts on the website. So we will support you and your communications person um, and keeping the community informed because that's one important part as well. This is a position that is important for all and people typically want to know along the way, where are we in this step, right? Where are we in the process? We screen, again, we screen the applicants aligned to the board approved criteria that you all established with, um, along the way with input. And we gather input from stakeholders. This looks like in-person community forums. It looks like it could be virtual meetings with um, your labor groups, stakeholders in terms of your teachers, and if appropriate, your students, right? And so getting as much information as we can so that everyone feels that their voice is heard and, and we can inform the process. And then at the conclusion of the, the um, screening of applicants, we provide a written summary of all the applicants. We tier them uh, according to three tiers. The top tier is like, these are, we believe are really aligned to what the district is asking for. Tier two is typically that tier, you know, they're, they're, they're close enough, right? And tier three are the ones we would not recommend. But again, the board has full, it's your hire, not ours. We're just here to facilitate the process, but we will allow you all, we will prepare the report, outline measured against your criteria, and then go from that point and allow you to um, tell us what you'd like to have happen in the process. The responsibility that we ask for from a county office perspective is that um, you support with establishing that search process, that you commit to the timeline, we'll work together collaboratively on the timeline, and identify the stakeholder groups that you'd like to invite Typically, those are, again, teaching staff, management, confidential together, or separate um, classified group, and then parents. Um, we, When we hold community forums, we do so in English and in Spanish. We'll hold one, and it'll be simultaneously um, translated for our um, Spanish-speaking families. And we also ask that you support and with developing the leadership profile. And that is what we use to um, create the brochure that we send out to um, various um, organizations, as well as our own networks within the state and across the uh, United States, if you'd like to consider applicants in other places. Um, and then submit interview questions aligned with specifications. What we do is we take the interview questions, we align those to what the community is saying. So once we get all the input from, from everyone, we then work with you all to say, here, here's some sample questions that we believe will help to answer the most questions that folks are looking for, but it's all a collaborative process, again, with just the county office, my team facilitating that, and guaranteeing confidentiality. This is a very emotional um, process for an applicant. They go through a lot of, to getting letters, recommendations, preparing the um, packet and what have you. So it's just really a tight process that we will facilitate for you and support you in doing um, the best work here. Um, so a bit more about our process. We have it in various um, stages that you'll have in front of you. Um, we go through phase one, which is really engaging with the board to support um, meeting and conferring with you all. 
establishing criteria that you're looking for. Um, we uh, identify a point of contact along with you. Um, the next phase is the recruitment phase. But before we can do that, we want to meet with individual board members. Each of you have something that you're looking for. And we compile that information um, and synthesize it so that you all can understand what, what the common themes are from each of you um, as individual governing board members. We use that information to also um, create the brochure that we're going to create, as I mentioned earlier, as well as posting. So we'll grip on a posting. You get to see everything before it's even sent out to anyone or any organization. The phase three is the engagement phase, where we um, spend the time interviewing with working with staff in um, virtual setting or in person, that's what is preferred, um, facilitating community forums, as well as um, developing the questions. That I, I'm repeating myself again. I was ahead of myself in the slides. <laughs> But we want to get as much engagement as possible because everyone has an input and, and is very concerned about who's going to lead the district moving forward. Um, the interview phase, we take the applications, we screen them again according to the criteria. We create detailed report for you all, each candidate, what we identified as being aligned, what you're looking for, and you will get a binder that will have everything listed and you get to walk through it and we walk through it with you in a closed session and explain to you how we rank these individuals and you all have opportunity to say, you know what, we agree or we disagree or whatever you want to share, but um, we are really clear with um, measuring against what you've given to us. Um, we then spend time with, um, with each of the candidates answering questions that they have. We make sure that um, we support them along the way in terms of getting things in on time. And um, we will post in various venues. We, we can walk those through with you if you choose to use us, but any search firm will do the same exact thing. They will talk with you about how, how far you want to expand that reach. Some districts have shared with me, they want to just stay within California. Others are interested in considering candidates from across the United States. It just depends on what your interest is and where you want to reach far from. And then when it comes to um, the actual interview, we will facilitate the process in a location, that, whether it be here or whether it be the county office, sometimes, Folks rather have at the county office so that there's no um, looky lose, you know, and seeing who it keeps more confidential. So that way um, we can make sure that the candidates are feeling good about um, their decision to apply. And we'll go through the um, initial round of interviews with you all. And then from that point, select the finalists. And sometimes that happens on one day. Sometimes it happens in two days, depending on how long the day goes. I will say to you that um, the last several we've in engaged in have been all a one-day experience because it's just they want to be done with it. Right? So again, we will work with you on timeline and process. And at the final stage, we will support you with, if you need to, um, need the support with advertising or uh, announcing that superintendent that was selected, but also um, any transition time. I know our superintendent will support in terms of transitioning into that new role in this county, but whatever we can do to help along the way and help onboard that uh, new um, that new leader for you. Um, I have here a sample timeline. This is just a sample. So um, it's about a three to four month process that, that it takes to get that right candidate on board. And we don't want to rush it, but give people plenty of time to get their paperwork in. But Typically, a planning meeting starts first, and then we have stakeholder input sessions. I put that down as like February and March. Um, then an advertising recruitment will happen between April and March and April, about eight to 10 weeks. It could be a little bit longer if you want to. And along the way, we will let you know, gee, we're at week number two. We only have this many candidates. We're at week number five. But I will share with you that the majority of the applications come in that last weekend. <laughs> so I don't want you to, well, if you're working with us, whomever you're working with, it's the last hurrah. So we will, again, along the way, let the point of contact know where we are in the process and how many applicants thus far that we have. Um, and then applicant vetting starts around April, May-ish. Um, we work with you all again to walk through each candidate, their qualifications, who we recommend. And um, you all tell us who you want to invite to the semifinalist review and we will engage in those interviews and then from that we select the final candidates with you, you all let us know and then we move on to um, interviews and the appointment date would be around June and we negotiate that employment agreement with you if you need us to support with our legal department otherwise you are can do that on your own and we can see a start date of July 1 so that again if that's your preference but what will happen is you will speak with the outside consultant and share here's where we want that person to start and we backwards plan from that point and help you to understand Here's what we want to do along the way. So that is that part. And um, I want to just highlight for you, we have 
um, engaged in many searches along the way. And these, we began um, as a county office supporting districts with searches in 2017. And we have, a, um, gosh, about 13 so far. Three of those have been cabinet level, not superintendent positions, but 10 have been. And all of them have either maintained their position through retirement, they've had second terms of, of their position, but no one has been released from the board. No one has left, not in good standing. Um, if they've left, it was with retirement or for a new opportunity. Um, so I want you to know that those are just a variety of smalls and large and charters all mixed in there, there together. So that is a positive track record that we're really proud of to be able to um, support. And you'll see that two of the districts, we've been able to support them two times already. So, and let's see here. The next steps for you all would just be to decide how you want to proceed. If you choose to um, go with outside firm, you would then reach out to that those firm members, engage in agreement. If you choose that you want to use San Diego County office, you just reach out to me and, um, but you'll want to get it agendized in terms of um, to make your decision. And then we go from there um, and the process begins. So that is pretty much the, the gist of it all. And should you want to move forward with me and my team, then we'll come to another conversation with you and get more than nitty gritty details down. So, all right. Are there any questions that you have for me? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Rogers for your presentation. A um, couple of questions for you. How many professional staff at the county office work exclusively on searches? And I'm looking at your list. How many in, la in last year did you do that were superintendent searches? Last year we had, let's see, we engage in three superintendent searches and two cabinet level. Okay. Yes. And how many staff? We have that work on our superintendent searches successfully at two to three. So I have, I we usually use our retired um, Chris Rising as a support for us. He was our former, my position, and um, he does very, really well with this work. Um, and my recruiters um, support with this and my director of certificated. So we've got about three to four people working on the process at a time. And um, it, it's gone really smoothly there. They have it locked up <laughs> movement, so. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, are you going to be using parents? It just, it, uh, we're gonna do whatever the board asks us to do. So we will engage the way that you all have asked. We'll, we go forward with this. We'll have more communication about what we believe is best practices, but we do recognize that it's important to get community feedback. So how it goes, we will define that together. Anything else? All right. Thank well, you, thank Dr. you. Martin. Thank you all for having me here. All right. And I would have a question for you, Mrs. Martin, just informational, since we've never done this before. Um, what is the protocol for the board's process for discussing what our options are and talking about what we'd like to do as our next? Because I know this is a process that happens very much in the in the uh, meeting format. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What um, our options are for having that kind of communication among ourselves? So the board should not be having communication amongst itself. That's not agendized. Otherwise, that would be a violation of the right. Brown Act. Mm -hmm. However, um, it is okay for you to speak to me, and I would say the board president, individually, okay. um, because in just expressing what your, what your recommendations would be, um, I have talked to legal counsel about the possibility of having closed session agenda, you know, when it's appropriate to have closed session discussions on the superintendent search right now, just because we're just starting out, it wouldn't be appropriate. And we want the community to be involved in the process. Um, I think having Dr. Rogers here was really a way to, we've heard what the community says and I highly recommend that we involve in whatever for, format that is, surveys, community forums, parents, the community members, the staff, everyone. But I would say that um, initially it would be conversation that would be with each individual board member and uh, the board president and I to see if there's an initial consensus. So, you know, I'll probably be reaching out to you either by phone call or individually or um, in email that is just what would your preference be after hearing this? And if I can see some kind of consensus, it's easy enough to move forward that way. 
And if there isn't a consensus, can we just put it on the agenda mm -hmm. for the next meeting so mm -hmm. we can exactly. talk about it, you know, in, in an open yeah, meeting? It, and so if there was the, the, it would work through the uh, board president directing me then to invite uh, search firms to come and do presentations like the county office did. Um, or if it was to do it internally, which I highly not recommend. No. Anyway. <laughs> but, you know, we would do whatever the board directed us to do. So if it was the uh, that way, then we would work to have another presentation at a, another board meeting that would be public about what hearing what a search firm could provide of the three options. Is it appropriate for us to say at today's meeting, could we put on the agenda for the next meeting having three of the top search firms that CSBA has used um, do a presentation so we can get a sense of what the alternatives are and what their experiences are and how that fits with our needs. I can I can do that. You know, any board member can request a, an agenda item. So I can go ahead and put that for the next um, board meeting to have presentations by the uh, three top firms or the recommended firms there. Um, and then have them do something that would be similar to this. Mm -hmm. And then after hearing that, perhaps the, the board would feel more comfortable with making a recommendation. Sounds good. So we'll do that's that. okay the, with our board oh, president. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you for sitting in it. We'll do that at the next meeting because I think as you saw outlined, whether it's the county office or a search firm, mm -hmm. the clock's ticking mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, wanting to be able, and, and sometimes Dr. Rogers probably can um, um, speak to this more than I can they'll have special board meetings yes. that is only for yes. involved with the superintendent search and some things that need to happen right. because it looked like some things that need to happen may not fall on when we have a board meeting some decisions may need to be made sooner than that so when absolutely is our correct. next board meeting uh the 27th february 27th and is that okay in terms of what you think or do we need to do a special meeting well, let me reach out to the search firms and see, you know, I mean, I think that should be sufficient time, but um, let me reach out and make sure. And if not, then if we need to have a special board meeting or whatever it would take to do that. Thank you so much. Any other questions for me? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank Rogers. You. Thank you. All right, so now we have a first reading board policy 6163.21 animals at school, and I will turn it over to Mr. Morris. All right. The clicker, guys? You've got it? Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm going to keep going. All right. <clears throat> All right. Good evening, Dr. McCray, members of the board, Mrs. Martin, Dr. Hughesin. It is my privilege tonight to share a proposed board policy with you, which is board policy 6163.21, animals at school use of therapy dogs. I want to start by thanking Ms. Alita Leonard, a speech and language pathologist at La Paloma, who partnered with us in the process. She is amazing to work with. Um, as a brief history board, during the fall, we had two staff members request to bring therapy dogs on campus to support and work with students. Ms. Leonard and one other staff member in the district were those staff members who requested it. In this situation, these two staff members were the owners of these dogs. The dogs were trained and they had worked with the dogs. At the time of these requests, our site administrations acknowledged and recognized the benefits of having therapy dogs on campuses. Uh, our cabinet also recognized the benefits of having therapy dogs on campuses. We, we got it. We then had a board meeting where Ms. Leonard and members of the La Paloma staff attended and expressed support for Sandy. Uh, her trained therapy dog, and uh, they advocated for having Sandy on campus. 
And please know, as educators, we all accepted the fact that having therapy dogs on campus is a good thing and not a new thing. Schools have been doing it. However, when these requests came in, we did not have any board policy to support the requests. We also did not have any administrative regulation, liability insurance, district approved permission slips either. So our challenge was how do we find a way to support the dog handlers, the staff, and most importantly, the students that were benefiting from or can benefit from the dogs. So we began researching and I have to be honest, it was a lot of fun to research. Um, <laughs> Dr. Hussein, Mr. Rodriguez and I began, uh, we began reading news articles, reviewed board policy from a, a district in Northern California who had a dog, reviewed uh, California School Boards Association. I had many communications with our Joint Powers Authority, the JPA, spoke to neighboring school districts, and of course, we consulted legal counsel as well. After completing the research, we drafted the board policy you have in front of you that is BP 6163.21. Now board, this draft board policy we provided you is very thorough and very comprehensive. This board policy ensures dog training, vaccinations, licensing, insurance, appropriate identification on the dog, proper supervision and care of the dog while on a campus. <coughs> It allows the principal to identify specific areas the dog can be on campus, as well as the parameters for dog handlers when working with a dog on a campus. This draft policy ensures legal protection for the dog handler, legal protection for the students and the staff, legal protection for the district, and an insurance amount that is adaptable for future scenarios as needed. The board policy requires the dog handlers to provide an insurance policy that protects our district and everyone involved with a minimum $1 million policy. However, we can require an increased amount on the insurance policy if we feel it is necessary. We feel this board policy is comprehensive and is the answer to being able to allow to have therapy dogs on our campuses. At this point, I wanna invite Ms. Leonard and Sandy up to speak a little bit as well. <laughs> Hi, Aaliyah Leonard. I'm a speech and language pathologist. I've worked in Falbert for 17 years. Sandy has been a registered therapy dog since 2019. She just got recertified last year. Um, and I think that she would be amazing for my program. She has volunteered at nursing homes in the past and seeing the language come out and the talking and the opening up of people, just having her there was absolutely incredible. Um, they like to talk about her. They like to talk about their own dogs. I can imagine students doing the same thing, coming up, oh, I have a dog at home. My dog looks like this. Um, increased vocabulary. Sandy's an interesting looking dog. <laughs> she has interesting hair. She does interesting things. We can give labels and specific words to those things so we can talk about her in those specific ways to give them words to talk about their dogs as well. She's a conversation starter. Um, kids like to talk and they like to talk to her, actually. They talk to me, but they also would like to talk to her. She is non-judgmental at all. She likes to listen to people talk. She will sit with ears perked and listen to you. Um, kids can practice their speech sounds. Kids can practice their social skills. Kids can practice their language to her without any judgment from anybody. And she actually kind of encourages them to do so. She's very motivating the kids would be able to choose to pet her maybe at the end of a therapy session rather than play a game. So it's, do you wanna play Candyland today? Or do you wanna spend five minutes petting Sandy at the end of our session? I would imagine that most of the time they wanna pet Sandy because that's pretty fun giving her treats. They learn how to pet her. They learn how to interact with her. There's, there would be lots of rules about interacting with Sandy. It wouldn't just be a free for all because she's little. And <laughs> she's a little scared of getting stepped on. Um, and it's a very calming environment. There are some kids who might be a little timid around her. There will be no expectations to interact with her, no expectations to pet her. It is all about what's comfortable with the kids. So I hope that she will be able to join myself in my program. 
at La Paloma. She's staring at you, Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> so board in wrapping up, we ask that you consider this draft board policy as a solution to being able to allow dogs like Sandy on campus. Please know this is a first reading. And if you choose, you will have the opportunity to vote on this board policy at the next board meeting, if you choose. And at that point, we open it up to any questions you might have. I was reading this. I thought I read somewhere that they could only be on campus for two hours a day. No. Um, if she were volunteering specifically for pet partners and we went maybe to a nursing home or we went to a specific site, that is the limit of two hours. When they are coming to work with me, I make sure I would make sure that she would have breaks throughout the day. She would have a bed, a little bedroom <laughs> right now. She has a crate that's already there, ready and waiting, um, to make sure that she doesn't get tired as well. It's a big princess. <laughs> <laughs> she is cute. Yeah, Miss McBride. Okay. Say hi. A couple questions. Um, so. Do, this, do the children come into your office? Is that how it works? Yes. And, and so yes. they, they, she doesn't actually go into the classrooms while the lectures or anything like that? No, no. Um, I typically see kids every 30 minutes. So I go pick them up and we get to walk and talk. When I pick them up from their classrooms, we walk to my therapy room. Um, if she happens to, you know, she would be with me, we could talk about her because they love her, but it gives me a chance to talk to them. And um, she doesn't go in the classrooms when the when the teachers are teaching. There's no need for her to do that. I stand at the door and call the kids out, and then they come to my room. Love to see it in action. Love <laughs> um, thank you. You are welcome to come. I love having people in my space. It gives the kids a chance to practice the social skills, and for people to get to see what I do. So Sandy would be at which school again? La Paloma. Mm -hmm. um, just want to mention today I was I was at UCSC walking to my next class and there was a couple you know, approaching and they had a they had a, they brought a, a dog right um, I think it was a husky but it had long hair beautiful beautiful dog and the person in front of me stopped and right away started asking about the dog and asked if he could pet the dog so they were sure they let him pet the dog and he says. This thank you. This made my day. Oh. It was a Monday. I was like, <laughs> 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 um, but I mean, just seeing an adult react in that way. I mean, uh, Sam, I'm, I'm definitely would love to see Sandy at, at school. Yeah. Mm. That, that would mean a lot to have her be able to come and be part of my program again and just part of the local of, of women's community. I wanted if you had a question and then I had uh, well I love dogs so I'm I'm 100 if we can get therapy cats and rabbits and <laughs> go with all of it because I will pet all day long therapy horse yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one to do yeah, I, I would pet the dog all day yeah. I think the adults like would like to have her just as much as the students yeah. well two things. Mr. Morris, I wanted to thank you for the outstanding process that you went through and the research you and your team did to get information. You get credit. Policy and procedures, awesome. And I also want to acknowledge and thank um, you, Ms. Leonard and Sandy, of course, um, for all the work that you do. Um, we have eight chickens at our house and I have one therapy chicken. <laughs> so I totally get it. <laughs> Anybody can come for a visit. You can, you can hold F squared and <laughs> she'll calm you right down. <laughs> so thank you both. I was going to ask, why would they have multiple dogs on a campus? Is there a reason for that or just in, in the different classrooms or something? So the way the BP draft BP is designed is that um, staff would submit the request to the principal who would agree whether or not to have a dog or more than one dog. And then it would go to Mr. Rodriguez, our executive director of student support, who would vet it and determine if it's appropriate to have more than one dog. As of right now, we're not planning to have more than one dog. However, there could be an exception. The policy is written with flexibility where it, it could happen. But as of right now, we prefer to just have one. Right now, the only requests we have are two requests. But 
a site realistically would have one. I, we don't foresee seeing more than one dog on a campus, but the policy is flexible. We could get there if we needed to. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, thank you, boy. All right, thank you. Very much. All right. Okay, so now we have an action item, NCCSE Trustee Review Committee appointment. It is recommended the governing board appoint an FUESD board member to the North Coastal Consortium for Special Education Trustee Review Committee. Do I have a motion? Okay. Are there any nominations? I'd nominate Mr. Pryor if you had any interest. I think he'd be terrific. I'll call for the vote. Aye. 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 And I as well. Okay, we have another action item under business services. Second reading and approval of resolution number 10 of 2022 and 2023 of the governing board of the Fallbrook Union Elementary School District consenting to a territory transfer with Bonsall Unified School District and authorizing the superintendent to submit a petition to the county superintendent. It is recommended the governing board approve resolution number 10 of the governing board of the Fallbrook Union Elementary School District consenting to a territory transfer with Bonzo Unified School District. Okay, that's okay. Can you still have a copy of that map that they presented in their thing last? Meeting. Yeah. Not handy, but we might do it here. Well, if you give me a couple extra minutes, I can pretty well present it. Use your imagination. Okay. This was what was up. <laughs> this is Horse Creek Lake. Okay. This was to go to Fallbrook High School. It was all the high density condominiums. This over here was the medium price single family homes with a few up here. All this, the big houses, I'm talking, these are the primo lots. These are multi million. That was all going to go to bond. Okay. Just for your review. And thank you, uh, Ms. Martin, for replying to my questions about the insurance. I've asked a lot of questions at board meetings, and this is the first time I've ever gotten a direct and timely answer from the superintendent to a question I posed. I'm impressed. Okay, so back when Jennifer Jeffries was superintendent, I was a new teacher. People in Fallbrook have been screaming about consolidating districts for years. There was a meeting at the high school. Everybody was there. I was there. Were you there, Leah? I went. I'm probably the only person in the stream with it. And I've written on Facebook many times. People say, why, do we, why don't we consolidate? What? Okay, here it is. K-8 districts were established in rural areas because that was more local and easier to put together. You don't have to have a lot of special facilities. And then those schools feed into a consolidated high school, okay? And Fallbrook High School was it. If the two were to consolidate, then all the salaries have to be equalized among all the districts. Whatever the highest teacher pay is, everybody gets it. Whatever the highest classified service is, everybody gets it. It's not cost effective. And 
yes, we have duplication of administrations. So which administrators are going to volunteer to leave? I mean, we don't need the duplication of services, but we already have it. But we don't need to expand it. So my point is, why in the world would we want to en enlarge a small existing high school when we already have a big consolidated high school with excellent facilities already? I don't know who came up with it, but I read the paper regularly in all of Horse Creek Ranch was supposed to be Fallbrook High School, Fallbrook Elementary. And I don't know if the developer came up with it or what the motivation was, but I find it very disconcerting that the big affluent area, they're gonna to go to bond saw. They need to increase the tax base for floating bonds if they ever wanna build a high school and all that kind of thing. I see no benefit to those of us in Faber, to, to increase support for Bonsal High School. And if you really think about it, the only reason it came about was because of a lot of affluent people want to keep their kids in their own little private little community down there. And it has not benefited the community. It leads to divisiveness. It leads to affluency being stuck in one area rather than benefiting the whole community. <laughs> um, I think it's very di divisive and I think it's discriminatory. And I don't ever wanna see a big area like that. Well, these kids go to that school and those kids go to that school. I mean, I can see it all. And I don't know where the developer came up with it. Maybe it was a PR campaign. Well, we're going to make sure you go to the new fancy school. And why are we doing this? The demographics don't support it. The finances don't support it. And it's not good for public education. And it's not good for Fulbright. Both my girls went to Fulbright. I taught at Potter for 24 years. We need one consolidated high school. And we don't need all these other little special little areas with their special little kids all tucked away. Yes, <clears throat> we, most of the board knows, we do have um, Ms. Car uh, Caroline Brown, uh, the consultant if the board had additional questions. We remember she was on Zoom last time. Mm -hmm. So she is here in person if the board had additional questions to ask. No, because the person does not assign. But if you had any other questions or anything, she's here. Um, I don't know if you had anything, Ms. Brown. So if you had questions, additional questions to ask, if not, if you're ready to take action on this. We need a motion first before we can ask questions. Okay, do I? Oh, Ms. Brown, you have a question? I, I do oh, have oh, a you question. Have, you have to have a motion first. Yeah, sorry. sorry. You have to have a motion in a second. Uh, do I have a do I have a motion? A motion to approve. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Do I have a second? Thank you, Ms. McBride. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Ball. Uh, well, I was just wondering if this goes through, the transfer goes through, and it's signed off, and everything's done. Does that mean that they, the new communities that they're building, if people purchase or rent they don't have um they don't have uh a re they can't do an inter-district transfer anymore if that's totally off the table for them no no i mean that's not what it means this is just what the district of residence would be for them they could it, it wouldn't have any impact on um, inter-district transfer requests so that's a totally separate issue it just would define which what the district of residence is be it Fallbrook Elementary or Bonzel. And then of course, if it's Fallbrook Elementary, that is Fallbrook High School District because we share the same boundaries with them, but it's not um, affecting inter-district transfer requests. I do believe I may have a question for Mrs. Brown. Um, So are there any future um, 
plans that that would involve moving things, changing things that there are that are being discussed at all? You mean across the entire district or in the specific area? Um, uh, well, how about both? No. <laughs> no. um let's just cover the whole we did when we looked at um doing the territory transfer we looked around the district to see if there was a if there were 800 homes that could go easily to bonzel and 800 homes could go easily to fallbrook it would be a 50 50 split i mean it, you know it would just be very equal and that's the goal is to make it revenue neutral um equitable and um balanced and and it had and we have to follow ed code to do that. And there are thresholds that we have to meet, which are all in the report. Um, so there are no other developments that I'm aware of for the area that would constitute a territory transfer between districts. Well, I heard somewhere that there's talk about building a school there. Is that anything? Part of the specific plan includes the park services that you have. There's a commercial uh, development that's down close to the 76th. And part of the master plan community is a 10 plus acre school site that could be acquired and a school could be built. And it's in the Bonzel side. On the Bonzel. Yeah. Okay. Seeing no further questions, I'll call for the vote. Ms. McBride. Um, I'm not sure that I have enough information. Mr. Favela? Aye. Aye. Well, um, I, I'm going to check, or I'd like to check into a couple more different things. So your your vote will be yes, um, and I will vote yes. Okay. Motion carries. Okay, we have another action item: CSEA tentative agreement. It is recommended the governing board approve the comprehensive tentative agreement with the California School Employees Association, chapter number 307. The agreement includes the following, effective July 1st, 2022, the classified salary schedules contained in Appendix A, longevity and bachelor's, master's and doctorate stipends shall be increased by 7%. In addition, a 1% one-time off-schedule payment shall be provided to unit members employed by the district as of this date. Tentative agreement is approved by the governing board. The 1% payment shall be calculated based upon the updated 2022-2023 salary schedules and include longevity, bachelor's, master's, and doctorate stipend. The 1% payment shall be prorated for unit members hired after October 1st, 2022 Effective January 1st, 2023, the current negotiated cap district contribution for health benefits is $750.27 for employees only, $1,421.12 for employees with one enrolled dependent, and $1,975.90 for employee and family on a tenthly basis. For the 2023 plan year only, a one time off schedule payment of $600 shall be paid to each unit member who is eligible for benefits based on their part-time status. Approval of the tentative agreement concludes negotiations with CSEA. Do I have a motion? I so move. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. I'll call for the vote. Ms. Sabal? Aye. Ms. Lundin? Aye. Mr. Favella? Aye. Mr. McBride. Can I vote aye as well? Motion carries. We have your educational services, action 2023-2024, Mike Choate Center Preschool Instructional Calendar. 
It is recommended the governing board approve the Mike Schultz Center Preschool instructional calendar for the 2023-2020 school, sorry, 2024 school year. Do I have a motion? A motion to approve. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. I'll call for the vote. Ms. Sabal? Aye. Ms. Lundin? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Favela. Aye. Thank you, Ms. McBride. Aye. And I will vote as well. Motion carries. Thank you. It is recommended the governing board approve the consent agenda as presented. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. I'll call for the vote. Ms. Lundin? Aye. Mr. Favela? Aye. Ms. McBride? Aye. Ms. Sabal? Aye. And I will vote aye as well. Motion carries. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Do I have a motion to adjourn? I don't think we need one. Do we need one? Oh, we're supposed I, to. She's like, just make a mistake. This no. <laughs> <laughs> well, one would be yeah. confused. Yeah. I think the meeting is still going on. There should be <laughs> We just learned I'm to do that. We're trying. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second. Meeting adjourned. Meeting adjourned. At